Today in Chris Performance Repair, we're going to go ahead and assemble this Coyote motor. We have a 50 Ford from a 2018 Mustang GT. It is getting a twin turbo kit, so we have some performance parts sitting down here on the floor, and we're going to get them installed in the block today and make a short block out of this video. So I have some things already done, and we're going to cover that in a moment, and then we will go ahead and get into where I started this project off at. gonna assemble an engine. I have the crankshaft, I have the pistons, the rods, the rotating assembly, everything's all done. Now I already have a bunch of stuff done on this motor as far as ring gap all figured out, things like that, but a couple things I want to state on this episode in regards to the engine itself. This engine, all the parts, we ordered a rotating assembly pre-balanced, right? Okay, so a balanced rotating assembly consists of all the weights being equaled and then made sure that the crank counterweights work with the balanced rotating assembly. So to make sure that the bob weights and everything spins rotates perfectly without any vibrations or misbalance or anything like that, we have to have it balanced. The person that we went through for this kit did a half-ass balance. Now let me explain for a second. So this has been correctly balanced now at this point. The half-ass balance was a situation, actually I'll grab a box. And the box is a telltale sign of what they did. So on the box, you can see we have a couple of numbers here. We got a 209.4 and a 463.5. What that is, big end, little end. So they took the weight of the little end, took the weight of the big end, and they marked it on the box, and then they stuffed the rod in the box. So they did that, and they called it good. They weighed it. That was it. And then they took the average of all the rods and the average of all the pistons and then balance the crank for that average number. Now, that average number is not a good number to go off of because it's going to be imbalanced. Obviously, you're going to have different weight rods and piston assemblies and if the builder doing the motor doesn't do his job and mix and match the weights correctly to make everything equal when the pistons are not marked, mind you. So the pistons have no markings on them as far as weight goes. They never took the time to say, hey, this piston weighs 400 grams, five, oh geez, wow, that thing slid pretty easy. Anyway, uh, they never took the time to mark the pistons as far as their weights, so I'd have to have a scale to take and match the lightest piston with the heaviest rod combination, and the heaviest piston with the lightest rod combination. Well, instead, get the proper balance done. So we took the time, sent this assembly in, and we had a proper balance done. Now, what is a proper balance? They take and equalize all the weights. For example, you can see this piston here, there's grind marks underneath that wrist pin area, just a real small amount of material removed, and it's on both sides, right? This one here does not have those marks. That's because this piston is a lighter piston than this piston when it came out of the box. So they had to reduce some weight on this piston to make it match that piston. So they had to match this piston weight with all the rest of the pistons, which means removing weight from all the rest of them that did weigh more. There might be one that weighs the same, but I doubt it. Usually, if there's no markings on it, that's because that's the lightest one. Uh, and then they have to do that with the rods as well. But the rods are a little more complex because you have both ends to deal with. So you take the lightest, lightest end here and the lightest end here, and you make all the rods match that lightest end on both, right? So this one, you can see, this has been sanded a little bit here. It has not been touched here. That's because this weight is okay. This weight was too heavy compared to the lightest weight. So all equal, everything's good to go now. So as you can see, I am cleaning away at the parts. We're starting with the crankshaft. The crankshaft has to be cleaned very, very well because during the balancing process, it gets quite dirty from all the grinding and stuff that they do to the crankshaft. So we need to clean out all the oil passages. We need to clean out anything else. We wanna use a brush when we clean these things out. Lots of brake clean and some shop air to make sure we blow all the debris that might still be in there out. And then we're going to do the same darn thing with the connecting rods, only it's less aggressive of a tactic to clean those because they don't have the oil passages necessarily in them. And then, of course, we got to clean the pistons as well to make sure there's no debris in those. Then we can finally start the assembly process. So now I am to the point of where I'm ready to assemble things. Everything's obviously all cleaned up. We should be good to go there. I have 
bearings laid in place, the ones that came with the rotating assembly. So we'll see what their tolerances are. I did not measure anything yet. Uh, normally at this point, I would probably take the caps, at least one of the main caps, throw it in here and get a bore measurement. However, the place that I use for my bore measurements is on vacation. So rather than play with my tools, which are not nearly as accurate as his tools, I'm going to go to my old standby of plastic gauge. Yes, I use plastic gauge and no, it's not as bad as you think. Now the fancy bore gauge tools that a machine shop would use are very accurate. Yes, if the operator uses them correctly. Now I've stated this in many build videos before and I'm not going to cover it too deep on this one because I don't want to go in depth with it. If you want to see more about the plastic gauge and stuff like that, I'll go ahead and throw a couple links to a couple different videos up in the corner above. But basically the criteria is all operator error that causes plastic gauge or even a regular bore gauge to be inaccurate. It all comes down to the operator and how you use the product that you're using to measure with. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little plastic gauge checking on this thing. I'm going to do a couple different versions and I'll explain them when I bring it up to show you. You can see I have some studs in here right now. So these studs are the ones that are going to be in here. I also took and put the head studs in. So I'm going to grab that crank. We're going to set it in place here. I already got it all cleaned up. So I can just go ahead and place it down, plop it down in there very carefully, of course. And this is a factory crank. Now, I did want an aftermarket crank in this thing because I do not like the factory crank design. However, apparently that must not be much of an option because they didn't get one. But this one is cryo treated so it's been heat treated with a process that basically deep freezes and heats up and somehow it changes the molecular or the metal on a molecular level to make it much stronger than it normally would be and hopefully that's more than enough to make this thing strong enough to support the power this guy's going to make hypothetically it will be but my concern wasn't holding the power my concern is holding the power over time because of the way this crank is cut and the way it's set up, I'm worried about this very last section of the crank near the back where there's kind of a weak spot where it's prone to breakage. And on that particular spot, I had another Ford, an EcoBoost V6, where the crank broke on a factory motor. Uh, it did have some modifications done to the truck. It had a little extra boost, things like that. And the truck was beat on, but over time, eventually, the crankshaft cracked in that same weak spot that looks identical to what this one is. The only problem is this one has two extra cylinders in front of that, so extra torque to yet transferring through that section. So over time, it might break, but hopefully the cryo treating is enough to make it last that much longer is kind of the goal there. So now I need to go ahead and do the plastic gauge on this thing. So I'm gonna start laying it out. And like I said, I'm gonna give you a couple different versions of doing the plastic gauge. Now turning the crank on dry bearings, is obviously bad to an extent but if you're lifting i'm lifting a little weight off of it and all i'm doing is just turning it enough to get the oiling holes out of the way of the plastic gauge now that i have that out of the way i'm going to go ahead and start laying my plastic gauge out because i want to see what these things measure at and uh, you guys will be right back to see the results i'm going to get everything plastic gauge in everything torqued down not move the crank and then once i have that done i'll pull everything apart without moving the crank again and we'll go ahead and look at the plastic gauge and I'll probably just show you guys on the main caps because it's much easier to see that than through this channel area here. Uh, in fact, that's going to be a pain in the butt for me to clean. But besides the point, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what the plastic gauge looks like there. Okay, we have the mains here. I'm going to go ahead and flip them over now. I did miss one as I was doing it. I somehow skipped over this center guy here. Oh no, not this guy. This guy here when I was putting the plastic gauge down. It's not that I had it fall out of there. I think I literally forgot to put it in there because I remember distinctively laying this one and this one down, the diagonal ones, and then I laid these two and I'm like, oh crap, I did skip one. So I just skipped a beat. I'll have to measure this one later. So why did I do it at a diagonal like this? So what I'm doing is I'm making sure that this thing is consistent in, in a circular sense. If down here it's wider, and down here it's wider, but in the middle it's not very wide. That means I have an uneven or an eccentric circle going on in here. So I did two of them like that, 
and then I did two of them just laying them across like normal to get a basic clearance and we're gonna go ahead and see what the clearance actually comes out to now I don't know what to necessarily expect because like I said I haven't measured this one so we have about just a little over a little over two thousandths clearance on this guy <laughs> dominoes I guess I just won't even pick them up. So I'm about the same exact clearance on this guy here. I'm just going to lay him down like this. I'm not going to putz with that there. And then on this guy, we have a little, little tighter tolerance. We're at about one and a half on this guy here. This one's at about one and a half. So I have one and a half on these two, two on these two, Probably two here considering that's in the middle there. I don't know. I'd have to I'm gonna have to check that one here in a minute But regardless it doesn't really matter and I'll explain that in a second as well So basically when it comes to the bearing clearance here that I'm seeing I have a little more clearance on this end Assuming that this one ends up being two. I still have yet to figure that out But I have a little more clearance on these three than I do these front two now Why am I not too concerned about it? Well for starters this block is very stout, and by that I mean it's, I don't see it flexing very much. Uh, if it does flex, that's where a little concern comes in. You want a little bit of extra clearance over factory. Now my guess is factory clearance is probably one to one and a half thou, and being I have two thou on at least these two, if not this one as well, since I have definitely more than factory clearance, my guess is that we are gonna make up a little room for a little bit of block flex due to the fact that this thing is going to be twisting some pretty heavy horsepower and torque numbers. And with more horsepower and torque, it literally will twist the block. If the block moves this way or moves this way at all, you want a little bit of room on the mains to make up for any movement that, that happens that way so you don't have the, the metal push the oil out of the way to the point of where it goes metal on metal contact. Obviously that's bad that's gonna cause issues. I don't think this block is gonna do much of that. It has a lot of strength reinforcement on the side. It's not windowed down on the mains. It has six bolt mains. It's got everything bolted to it to add more strength to it. I just don't see this one flexing that much. Unless the guy exceeds 1500 horsepower, then it might start to tweak a little bit. By then, by the time he cranks it up that high, it'll hopefully be uh, well worked, we'll call it and have a little more clearance kind of built in on its own because race engines, over time, they will open up the bearings a little bit no matter what you do just because they make that much power. They're just, they're, they're gonna have some contact. There's so much force coming down on it, they will have a little bit of contact. Nothing that'll wear the Babbitt completely off the bearing. If you have that issue, obviously that's, that's no good, but uh, they do wear the high spots off. And once the high spots are worn off, you do gain a little bit of clearance. Not much, probably a quarter of a thou. Not a whole lot, but enough to make up a little bit of a difference and help things have more room. So, I'm going to go ahead and measure this last one. If you don't hear from me about it, it obviously wasn't a problem. I'm going to continue the build. And then I'm going to be using the same plastic gauge method of crossways on the rods as well. And when I do the rods, I'm going to be measuring... I'm going to try and concentrate it over on one side so that the plastic gauge lands in the middle up here and then lands over by the side over here. And the reason for that is to make sure that this rod doesn't have some kind of eccentric thing going on when it's actually torqued down. I could measure it with a bore gauge, sure, but again, I don't have that accurate of a piece of machinery and the machine shop isn't around. So I'm doing it as if you were doing it at home. The only way you can do that is with plastic gauge if you don't have the right equipment. Plastic gauge is a cheap solution and you can get readings from different areas of the thing. You just can't go all the way around because then your reading is cut in half, obviously, and it wouldn't be very practical. I don't see that somebody could lay that in there and not have issues. It'd probably end up getting squished between the, the cap and the rod. So I'm going to lay some in there. Uh, I might show you guys, might not show you guys that part, but that's how I'm going to go about the things, just to so let you know before I even get into it. Now, as far as ring gap goes... I talk lots about ring gap on this episode up here, and that ring gap is preset. I already preset it a while ago. I did not do it on camera on this engine. I have set all the ring gap for all the cylinders, and I will go ahead and throw it on the pistons and start sliding things in. So 
I do have the ring gap figured out on this one already, and I should be good to go. So a couple of things quick. I went to put the main studs in. I torqued down all the main part of the main studs, right? And then I went to do the little side bolts. Now, side bolts aren't needed for the bearing clearance, for checking bearing clearance. They're not near as critical. They're not a big deal. They're, they're kind of just to tie everything together. But I want to put the side bolts in, which are these guys right here. And I started threading them in. The thread pitch felt right, but before I got all the way down, I noticed it was wobbly. I grabbed it and it wiggled. It was loose in the threads. So I thought, wait a minute, is this a different thread? Grabbed some bolts, tried some bolts, realized nothing was working. Grabbed my tap and die set, and I found out it's actually a 9 by 125 thread in the block. This kit, which is the Ford 50 Coyote kit, I contacted ARP, but this kit, it comes with, or it came with, a 5x125. Now, when I contacted ARP, they said, wait, that's not, that bolt's not supposed to be in there. It's supposed to have the one that you suggested. And so they said, we'll take care of it. Don't worry, we're going to overnight and send out the correct bolts. All I ask you to do is put the bad bolts back in the box and then send it back when we give you the other correct bolts that will work with it. So ARP works with me. They did great there. Um, they didn't even ask for a receipt or anything. The, the customer honestly purchased this, not me, but that's okay. Either way, they were willing to work with me and get it taken care of. So they admitted the fault, took it care of it right away. That's good customer service. I can appreciate that. That's that. Now, pistons and rods. I'm popping in here because of this part of the job. I'm going to go ahead and assemble this, and then I'll bring you back for the last one when I do put the rings on the last one, things like that, just to cover the, the very last one just to show you how I went about doing the rest of them. But before I do that, I have to contact or mention something. I have to mention something specific. And you see how this says forward on it. Now, just because it says forward on different engines does not always mean that you could just put it on either side and forward. This motor, that happens to be the case. All you have to do is have them facing forward. It doesn't really matter. It, it, it can go either left bank, right bank, it doesn't matter. Some engines though, they have to face forward because of valve reliefs. If that's the type of engine you have, then it matters which bank it in. It might even matter which, so say this is your V, right? It might even matter which position it is. A small block Chevy, for instance, is a prime example. I know this is a Ford and a Ford video, hear me out. A small block Chevy has a large valve and a small valve or even an LS engine. So that, that way we're, we're comparing Ford's performance car to GM's performance car, okay? GM, the valve reliefs. There's a big valve relief and a small valve relief if you have valve relief type pistons, and that matters, of course, for making sure you have proper valve clearance. The valve reliefs are all equal on the Ford. The big difference with the Ford, at least with the manly pistons, I did not check the factory ones, and I've already, they're gone already. The big difference is this wrist pin, it's location. So the location of the wrist pin has been shifted over. It is closer to one side than it is the other side. I went ahead and I took my caliper and to measure it, I just did this. Of course, I had to try and center it as best I could. I'm not getting a super accurate measurement, but I have 229, so 2292, right? If I go over here, go to the other side, and I get it about center and measure it, 2228 versus the 2292. So that's a huge difference, right? That's uh, like 70 thousandths shift in one direction. Now, that shift is there for an actual really good reason, and it comes down to the piston design and how they want it to go up into the bore. So when it comes to piston wrist pin location, as you can imagine, the wrist pin location, when you're pushing a piston up to compress the gases on top, okay? If you're compressing the gases, and this thing is coming in at this angle, it's kind of pushing that direction, right? So as it's pushing that direction, it's also thrusting it against this portion into the cylinder wall. So if this has a slightly loose tolerance, as it's coming up, this thing's gonna go like this, and it's gonna push up sideways and bind slightly. So by taking the wrist pin and setting it off centered, now you're pushing more on this side, and because you're pushing on this side, it's gonna force it kind of to stay centered with the location it's going. And then when the explosion happens, it really doesn't matter because it's going to push from this side, which is going to push straight down no matter what. And this position isn't as critical. 
but it does have a little effect on that as well. So the wrist pin position is very important. If you were to put these in wrong, you would not have a valve interference issue, but you would adversely end up causing a lot more skirt and cylinder wall wear, where it would be very aggressive on them. You would actually lose power most likely because of the fact you would be tilting this so badly, you might even affect how well the rings can seal. So it's very important that you get those piston wrist pins in the correct position in order to make sure that everything works properly and in harmony with each other. Well, I have one piston in. Yeah, there's a, there's a reason that guys like me can make motors actually last because I actually pay attention. If Joe Blow had thrown this thing together and he just based it off of, well, it's direct bolt-on. They said it would fit, so it's going to fit. Yeah, it fit, but if you don't pay attention, you're going to have catastrophic engine failure after a little while. So, this modular engine must be slightly different than the previous pre-2017 engine. This is a 2017 to current base engine, and I believe the previous generation is probably different because this is for 2011 plus, and I don't think they realize that the 2017 plus has these oil squirters in the position that they do. They must be different somehow, some way. These bolts are an issue. These are the bolts that hold the oil squirter down. So currently, the first piston I put in, okay, this little spot right here, this little piece of the, the corner of the rod is nicking this bolt. And that's why I have the bolt out. So if you look at this bolt, there is one of these corners here. There it is. This corner right there. Hopefully I'll be able to zoom in on that so you can see it better. But there is a little bit of a ding in the corner of that bolt because the rod comes too close. So what I did was I took and replaced it with one of these bolts. So if you look at the difference here, the head of the bolt is much shorter. It gives just enough clearance, approximately 50, 60 thousandths, which is just enough clearance to know I'm not going to interfere when this thing's revving up. Uh, you, you should have 40 plus thousandths of clearance in order to not have interference when it comes to a rotating assembly. That's problem number one. Problem number two is something that a lot of people would miss. And that comes down to the oil squirters themselves. So right now, as is, if you look at that oil squirter that's down there, and you watch it when this piston comes up. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's slightly hitting it, just ever so slightly hitting it. And what it's doing is it's taking that oil squirter, and say it's this long, right? And it's just coming up and pushing up. Down, up, down, up, down. It's just doing this, right? So that's going to create a real small tick that's probably too small to actually hear when the engine is running. All the valve train and all the, the high pressure pump and everything else would probably cover up the noise that that would make on all of these. So a guy would not know that it's sitting there doing that, right? Over time, what do you think is going to happen to that little metal tube as it sits there and goes back and forth and fatigues? It's going to break off. Once it breaks off, the oil is not going to squirt the bottom of the piston. That piston is going to get hotter than it did before. So it's going to affect the tune in that cylinder, and that broken chunk will fall down, and it could potentially damage something inside here or get smashed in a way that it sends metal, small pieces of metal, through the engine. So obviously that would be bad as well. So building a motor, you better pay damn good attention if you're adding aftermarket parts because the manufacturers don't pay very good attention. They just make the part fit the specs that they are given. They don't necessarily account for little things like that. So you have to pay very close attention to make sure that that doesn't get messed up. So of course there's other things you need to check as well. This I did not check yet because I was concentrated on that, but deck height, you want to make sure that this thing doesn't come flying above the deck here. And it doesn't. It sits below the deck a little bit. So that'll be fine. And then you have to check your piston to wall clearance as well. Now, they ask for 3 thousandths piston to wall clearance on the piston sheet. I have 4.5 thousandths. So it's a little bit extra clearance. 
That's not the end of the world. The Pistons will be a little sloppy in there. But that's okay. And there's nothing I can do about it. These are the factory bores. So it's not like I bored this thing out and I bored it out wrong kind of a thing. It's the factory bore. There's nothing I can do. If it was too tight, I'd be able to open it up a little bit. No problem. But it's not too tight. It's actually too loose. So nothing I can do about that. So of course, now I'm between a rock and a hard place. I gotta figure out what I wanna do with those tubes. So I have the last piston rod assembly here. And uh, I did figure out a kind of a trick to figuring out the measurement before I even try and do the plastic gauge thing. But basically all I'm doing is I have this thing set to a certain size and I can just barely weasel it into here. It just ever so barely fits. So then I took and measured the width of this with my caliper like a so, right? And what I do is I got it zeroed out. So now it's zeroed out right there. And then I take and I squeeze it onto the crankshaft where the rod journal goes. And when it's on, oops, that was way too far. When it's on the crankshaft where the rod journal goes, I get two thousandths. But technically, I don't get two thousandths. I literally get two and a half, which is, that's going to be impossible for me to do freehand. But it shows two five, which means it's a, a little over two thousandths. But remember, I'm squeezing against this. And when I'm on that with zero, I'm not squeezing against it. So when I'm checking it, I'm going like this. I'm actually pushing down. So it's going to show more clearance than what is actually there. So I'm slightly under two thousandths. It thinks I'm slightly over, but I'm actually slightly under. And that's what I was finding when I was checking with the plastic gauge too. So I found a decent way to do it from home with not the fanciest caliper in the world. I mean, that's a, that's a fancy slide caliper, but a slide caliper isn't very accurate by any means. So I did find a, a reasonable way to do it if you have these. Maybe I'll throw a link in the description for these guys uh, if you'd like a set. They can be used if you're careful enough, but they are very, very finicky, and it's really easy to make this too small of a size to not be accurate. So once I do that, then I'm able to go ahead and finish putting this piston together. Uh, I need to make sure I have this the right direction, though. So I want... Okay, the bearings are in the right direction here. There is one thing. If you were to have a performance crank in here, see the bearing edge right here is right on the edge of that chamfer and the bearing edge on this side is actually inside the chamfer so you would want this side towards the crankshaft not the other rod uh, this motor doesn't technically matter because i still have the factory crank and the factory crank has an undercut instead of a chamfer on the crankshaft so i'm not too concerned about it but i still just if i can i make sure to try and do that so Right now, it's sitting, the, the cut-in is on that side. I think that's the side I want it on for where I'm going. Yep. So I can go ahead and leave that there. I can put the clip into the piston here. Now, normally the performance pistons will have this little notch when you have these C-clips in the position down here. And it makes it easy for me to have the clip in this direction. So I'll just slide it in and snap it down. This one, however, since the notch is over here, it makes it a little more difficult. I could put it in this way, but you don't want to. Um, or actually, normally it's over here. That's right. Yeah, it's offset. So normally they're offset over to the one side, but this one's actually a 90 instead of like a 45 offset. So it's a little harder to slide in here because that little spot causes an issue with where the clip sits. And so instead, I have to apply this clip differently. But when you put these clips in, you want to make sure they're this way. You don't want them this way. If they're this direction, as that piston's going up and down, it can, over time, fatigue the clip because it does have a small flex. I mean, not enough to probably even measure, but it could potentially fatigue the clip because of the weight of the clip going up and down at higher RPM. So I always just put them this way as an extra precaution for that reason. It might be overkill, might not be totally necessary. It's just what I do. Roll that guy into place, and of course we got to put our fishing rings on. We'll start with the oil ring. Go ahead and flop that guy on there. You don't have to worry too much about bending that. It's pretty easy to get in place. Find the, the split in the ring there, and then uh, I, I tend to just put it where the wrist pin is. It's just something that I've grown to like. A couple of these pistons, I actually had to clean up the bottom area where this oil ring goes because it had a... Uh, like this coating was built up in an area. So we'll see if this one does it, but probably not. 
So when I the slot for the oil ring is right there, and I have the slot for the, the top section of the oil ring right here. So the bottom section of the oil ring that I'm going to put on now, I'm going to put the slot opposite of the top one. And this one spins nice, so I don't have to worry about the, the extra material from the coating sitting on that one. Then, of course, we have a Napier second ring. So i got to make sure that I have the groove. I'll throw a picture in the corner for that facing the right direction. That did not go in as planned, but that's okay. I can adjust that. Very carefully when doing this by hand. You don't want to overextend any of these rings. You will damage them. And then this one, uh, I forget what it's called, but it has a chamfered area on one side on the inner portion. That chamfered area needs to go up on this particular piston ring. So I'll go ahead and throw that guy in there. There we go. And then when it comes to the ring gap, I throw those opposite of each other. Like that there. And that's how I set up my piston rings. Now I can go ahead, put it in. Oh, wait. First, I got to take the bolts off here. Then I can go ahead and put in the ring compressor and in the motor. So taking these guys off. If you ever struggle with pulling the rod cap off because of the dowels that are in there, there is a way you can do it if you have the, the bar of metal to do it with. But basically I have this big chunk of aluminum. Aluminum is a very soft metal, of course. And then I have the tape wrapped around it. All I do is I take this guy, it just barely fits in there slide it down in here and I'm using this guy to hit the top of these bolts that are still threaded in, only a few threads though. And by doing that, I crack the thing free from itself. Now you can see one side didn't quite go, so there we go. Now it went. And since I left it threaded in a little bit, it doesn't go drop into the ground and I don't damage any of the threads. I also don't leave any marks whatsoever on the bearing surface. So now I can go ahead and throw this thing in the motor. Make sure my bearing is sitting in the right spot here. Very carefully, if you're going to set this down on anything, very carefully set it down. You don't want to scratch anything. Now I just have the basic band clamp style ring compressor here. Uh, simple old school ring compressor. If I didn't do so many different engines, I'd probably have the specific sized ones. But I do such a variety that having the size ones wouldn't necessarily be perfect for me. I can maybe do a 4.125. I've done quite a few of those motors, but I have never done one of these. I think it's like a 3788 or some weird number like that. I'd have to look again. I forget, but bore on this one's a little odd for me. I'm usually doing GM stuff. Okay, so when doing this ring compressor, obviously you want to get as tight as possible need to leave it above the bottom of the skirt because you need something to start in the piston hole. And then I also oil the inside of the ring compressor. That way it slides down a little bit easier. Now, of course, make sure the front arrow for the front of the piston is facing the right direction. Bearing is bottomed out. You can do it without the bearing in there if you like to, to prevent the bearing from falling. If you're too aggressive, the bearing can drop out of there. Usually they hold themselves in there. But I also have a bunch of plastic down here. Minus that bunch of plastic down here so it'll prevent damage if the thing does fall through. Now when using this style of ring compressor, the big important thing is to make sure you have that darn thing bottomed out and to keep it bottomed out the whole time you're putting it in there. Otherwise the ring will pop out on one side and it can be a little bit of trouble. While pushing this thing in there, if you have at any point you feel an excessive amount of resistance, then it has bound on one of the rings and you need to make sure that you figure out what's going on first. If it's one of the oil rings, it can bend really easy. So you gotta be cautious there. Once that guy is in place, we can take and flip this thing over so you can see better. Normally I just do it from underneath. I'm not sure how well you can see this. I'll just explain it on this one. But when you do that, usually the bearing will pop up a little bit. See how this has just popped up a little bit? Well, that happened on that side too. All you gotta do is just kind of push down on the ends, go back and forth to make sure it's seated all the way down. So I'm gonna do that quick. Then of course, grab your assembly lube. Well, I gotta do the plastic gauge on this one. But if you know it's measured, 
you can feel free to do this. I did measure it, and so far it's been consistent. I don't even know if I want to waste the time. I already explained plastic gauge to you guys once, so I'll just go ahead and throw this on there. I checked several of the other ones, and all of them were consistently good, as long as I measured it the way that I did with that, that technique I just showed you. So I feel comfortable enough. I've been doing that for a while now. I just haven't talked about it until now. It's something I decided to kind of try a while ago and have been doing in the background. But wasn't sure how good it was until I kept trying it to make sure it stayed good. So I feel comfortable with it. As long as it turns easy, I have no problem with it. There's another thing I've been trying and experimenting with as well when it comes to measuring things crudely. I put a dial indicator on here and I'll actually squeeze this this way and then squeeze it the other way to see how much movement the bearing has that way. And then I'll push the piston and push the piston and see how much movement it has that way by putting the dial indicator here. And that is also a different kind of way to measure to get an idea without the fancy bore gauge and fancy caliper. Torque it down and then you are good to go. So you can see I can still turn it over by hand, which is definitely good, especially on an iron sleeve cylinder or a iron cylinder. I'll just say iron cylinder, even though it's aluminum block. It has an iron sleeve. It's like a centered sleeve or whatever you want to call it. But the fact that I can turn this thing by hand by just grabbing the counterweights means that I have no resistance in the bearings or not enough to account for, and it's all in the piston rings. So I'm going to go ahead, tidy this up, and bring you guys right back. So that ends the bottom end of this engine assembly. So this Ford Coyote will be getting completed on the next episode, and we will have a glimpse of it running for you on that next episode. So stay tuned for that. And with that, like, share, subscribe, and as always, I will see you on the next episode. We will also be throwing in those little plugs for the oil squirters on the next episode as well, because that's when I got the parts in the mail. So stay tuned.